the American Revolution was not a liberal revolution to uh, basically liberalize oligarchical rule, right? Because you know uh, one of the arguments uh, that uh, people use, and, and I just read a book which I'm going to take to ribbons, tear to ribbons on this question. It says, well, the American Revolution was a, a revolt of Englishmen who wanted the rights of Englishmen who being denied the rights of Englishmen, and wh which is completely bonkers. It's completely, frankly, illiterate. Uh, uh, but the idea is that America was founded on these principles of you shouldn't have an absolute tyrant that you know, which is a king. And you had to box in the tyrant by an oligarchy, which is the parliament, because that's the and all different oligarchical families. They had the House of Lords, and, and they said, "Well, the America was trying to make, didn't want to live under a king, but the, but we were really revolting, so we would have parliaments run run the United States. People like James Fenimore Cooper, which I'll go through." who were clear that America was based upon a certain idea of man hmm, and and not a liberal idea. And he was hated by the liberal establishment, the transcendentalist and the liberal establishment for insisting that humans were noble and actually were world historic. And it was humans that shaped world history on the basis of ideas and principles. Hmm. And therefore, and just to give you sort of a, a broad sweep of of the questions that I'm asking, I'm asking myself to come up with the answers. First of all, you should understand who James Fenimore Cooper is. His father, um, and, uh, there's a, an interesting report that um, Tony Chaikin did on, in 2004. But uh, his father, William Cooper, in 1786, got 40,000 acres of land to found Cooperstown, right, which was upstate New York. Um, the lawyer for his father was Alexander Hamilton. And Hamilton wanted a guy like Cooper who was co trying to get good relations with the Indians. Hamilton College, which was founded uh, uh, in the 1780s, was based upon Indian participation. They were actually trying to assimilate the Indians and give them a college education. And that was one of Hamilton's projects. Right? Uh, so this guy, William Cooper, who's the father of James Fenimore Cooper, founds this Cooperstown in the wilderness to have a good relation with the Indians and recruit settlers who will have good relations with the Indians because this was a critical element uh, of, uh, of American, as Graham points out, that was one of the most critical things that America could do to expand westward is to somehow work with Indian culture. And you know the leather stocking tales were all about Indian culture, right? And, it, and what, he, what, what they hated Fenimore Cooper is that he portrayed Indians as human. Hmm? Limited culturally, but not racially. Hmm? In, in other words, the, the culture of the Indians were limited. Right? And therefore they had a certain freedom, hmm? but a certain lack of, of, of uh, agape, actually. Right? I mean, that, that's just the truth. They had something like agape because they're human, but a worked out idea of agape. And you, you see this in the, in the in particular, the one that I've just read is, is Satan's Toe, um, which is a brilliant, but the, but the most famous, in my view, one of the most brilliant things he ever wrote was The Wept of Wish Gone Wish, which is very rarely read or understood. It's a, yeah, yeah, but it, it's a brilliant insight into the limitations of the Puritans both their strengths, because they, they had this love of the Indians, they really did, 
and they, 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 and because they, they, they thought they were, they not even thought, they treated them as human, and insisted that they were human, right? Uh, uh, even the ones that were trying to kill them, right? For uh, it's a very complicated relationship, and it's developed most brilliantly in the web of Wish Gone Wish, um, which I won't go through. I'm not going to go through all these things, but. But he's, you, you had to deal with the question of, the, of Indian culture, culture as a culture, as nations, as a culture, as structures of government, of, of things like that, which is what the Levitt, see, what Cooper does, James Fenimore Cooper, is strategic studies. You know, I, I had said this to Lynn, and he, he totally agreed with me when I said to him, look, Lynn, because, because one of the NEC members said, look, I know he's a great man, but I can't read his novels. I said, that's because they're not novels. <laughs> they're strategic studies. They're not novels. They're not written as novels. They're written as strategic studies set against historically specific things that happen and placing types. Dutch, uh, Dutch settlers, uh, British settlers, uh, Indians... Right types that really participated in this history, right, and how those types interacted to create America hmm? in a culture that was actually developing as a as as a as a dynamic of these types without an oligarchy and with a mission to settle the the country. It had a mission. Right, the mission was to settle a country. To make a country free from oligarchism and settle it, hmm? and therefore, what, what, what would have been the limitations of Europe, which is you couldn't do that. Hmm? And he has these brilliant little things which I'll go through. But these are strategic studies; they are not novels, and therefore you cannot read them as novels. If you do not find the founding of America interesting, you cannot read James Fenimore Cooper. You can't do it. If you're not reading them from the standpoint of what made this country what it is, hmm? what are the relationships and the and the cultural and related problems to create a country like this, right? You cannot read James Fenimore Cooper. He's unreadable, which is why everybody freaks out. He is probably the most vilified uh, 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 writer in American history, right? And anyone who's honest in reading him from the labor committee thinks he's fantastic, right? Because you're intrinsically interested in the subject. Mm -hmm. There's a subject here. It's not an entertainment. It's not a novel. As Lynn said, the British created the novels, <coughs> right? It's, it's a British piece of shit. And he took the novel as a form and blew it sky high. And he was hated for it. And Mark Twain, who writes in the 1890s, goes ape shit. Absolutely livid ape shit against, against James Fenimore Cooper, primarily because Cooper portrays humans as noble, as representing principles. And and in in the famous uh, Tom Sawyer of little people <coughs> doing silly things, right? Uh, uh, you know, like Huck Finn and others, right? Little, little people. My, well, you know, and, and and not really doing anything world historic, just the entertainment of of manners, right? And he hates Fenimore Cooper, and he writes this violent, one of the most violent poems I've ever read, against Fenimore Cooper. Hmm? So 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 the the point is that who is James Fenimore Cooper? Well, his father is creates Cooperstown. Uh, is assassinated by one of Aaron Burr's assassins in 1809. It's actually assassinated and uh, uh, killed. They never found out why. They, by, by one of Burr's people. Because there's a violent brawl uh, on how to treat the Indians. Right? And the, the actual American faction wanted to assimilate the Indians and make them part of American culture, as everyone else was. Right? Uh, there's another faction which w was represented by Burr, uh, uh, by um, 
Andrew Jackson, who took the Cherokees and, and was one of the worst genocides America ever committed, was taking the Cherokees and sending them out west and dispossessing them, as opposed to the Hamiltonians and others who wanted to assimilate the Cherokee nation into, into being part of citizens of America with full rights and full uh, assimilation. And, and this Martin Van Buren, uh, uh, Andrew Jackson, the whole populist crowd who got rid of the Bank of the United States, who got rid of um, uh, uh, the Navy, everything else, uh, American arms, took down, but mainly the first bank of the United States is the thing that they, second bank actually, on the Biddle, got rid of the bank of the United States, right, were the ones who committed the genocide against the Indians, the Cherokee Indians, right, uh, in the South. So, so, so here's Fenimore Cooper, his, his father gets killed by Burr, by the Burr faction, right, who, the lawyer is Andrew, uh, I mean, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, Alexander Hamilton, right? Uh, which, which you'll find, by the way, repeatedly that these families are are American families and see themselves as a continuity from George Washington and from earlier families. Uh, that actually, you'll find their sons become great American leaders, right? Uh, so the the other fascinating thing is uh, about. James Fenimore Cooper is when he goes to Europe, he uh, uh, hooks up with uh, Lafayette, Marquis de Lafayette, uh, and he he's uh, he joins the Navy early on. Uh, Fenimore Cooper, he's part of this Whig grouping in the Navy, or well, not Whig, but American system grouping in the Navy, and uh, through certain military men, gets hooked up with the Marquis de Lafayette. And he tours Europe for seven years. Right? In which time, according to Chaikin, he write he's asked by the Marquis de Lafayette to write a um hold on. Um to write a defense of the American Constitution in Europe. Um, which is fascinating. He's also hooked into John Jay, who was a New York uh, lawyer, friend of Hamilton, uh, one of the writers of the Federalist Papers. Uh, he was in the militia uh, under uh, this uh, uh, guy who later became the uh, uh, was the governor uh, of uh, of New York, Governor Clinton, who who does the uh, famous Erie Canal. Um, DeWitt Clinton. Um, but what's interesting about the, the, the relationship to Marquis de Lafayette uh, is that he and Washington Irving were part of American intelligence operatives. Right? And what he writes, and this, this is where it, it, the plot thickens, um, he, he's very popular after he writes The Spy, which is the really the first most popular novel he writes. Uh, and the British somehow lay off him. They don't make a big thing of it, hoping he'll go away or something, right? Uh, but then when he hooks up with the Marquis de Lafayette, he writes three brilliant strategic studies. The Bravo, which is a strategic study of Venice, which is an American view of what a republic <laughs> is, right, and what a republic is not, right, because Venice was supposed to be a republic, right, and it's this brilliant, unbelievable insight uh, into the evil, the pure sophistry and evil of Venice. But at times, what he does, his method, is he will stop the whole book and say, me, this American, is about to tell you what's, what's going to happen. And you, and you will never understand what's going to happen unless I tell you. And he does a whole essay on the relationship of, of a republic, what a real republic is, versus this piece of sophistry. Right? They constantly, they constantly repeat throughout the book the, the laws of Venice. Well, we have to live by the laws of Venice. 
right? Uh, uh, which is which is straight sophistry, and of course I won't, won't ruin it for you if you haven't read it yet. But 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 the counter what he does the central irony is that while the action unfolds in which you find out that the Bravo himself is the most moral man in Venice, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and he's not a Bravo at all, but they needed to blame all their murders on someone. And since they had his father in prison, he agreed to let him be the fall guy. That's all he was, right, for this whole Venetian system. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but, what's, but the irony is at each time that Venice commits a horror, the next scene is people dancing in the streets, uh, either at night with masks or daytime without masks, but always the population is never affected by anything of the horror of what's going on actually determining their fate. They know nothing of it. And there's this constant play in the, in the, in the, in the book of, of that central irony. Right? Then he writes, one of, in my view uh, and Lynn's view, uh, and this is what this is where I got it. You know, I had read the Bravo, but but in the Heidenmauer, which is which is about it's called the the Heidenmauer is just called the Pagan Wall. That's, that's what it means, right? In the Heidenmauer is when the whole I clicked. I knew exactly who he was because in the Heidenmauer, he it's it's the exa- it's the transition of Germany. Under Luther, right? In, in other words, he chooses the Bravo because Venice was a critical problem for America because the British kept saying, "Well, Venice is a republic." The line on Venice is, "That's a republic." Hmm? And he, and uh, uh, Fenimore Cooper is taking that line. From an American standpoint, after the Constitution, and contrasting for Europeans what a republic actually is, he's making a strategic intervention. It's also critical for France at that point, because France is going through upheavals in the 1830s, uh, uh, right? I mean, remember, this is this is a mess for France at this point, right? It's a total mess in Europe. Um, so he, he does a strategic study. Then, he, then in the Heidenmauer, he chooses Germany, 1517, at the point that Luther is taking uh, taking hold in Germany. And it's a story of the Benedictine Abbey, which is the old Ultramontane order that had dominated and Venetian dominated order. Right, and the counterposing the abbey to the castle, the oligarchy, mm-hmm. the local oligarchy, and both fighting for the town, the burghers, right, and the complex interplay of a transition in Germany from Catholicism to Lutheranism. But yet, even that doesn't quite work, right? It becomes completely complex at the end. Now, I, I can't ruin these things for you. I'm not going to tell you, but it becomes completely complex. But it's this. But it's the, the piece is true genius. It's true genius because I've studied Shakespeare enough to know. What he does, in these, in the, you'll know it by the first hundred pages, is totally Shakespearean. In terms of the way he develops the characters, are completely Shakespearean. Including a, a character, a Falstaffian character, very consciously a Falstaffian character. In it. You know, uh, with drinking scenes and the whole... I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable the, the, how he's developing these, the, the battle between the abbe and the oligarchy, right? And then, and then, then, the women 
in the in the Cooper thing, you you it'll you won't believe it. It's pure Schiller. It's pure Schiller, the beautiful soul. Exactly as Schiller develops women. And I'm saying, oh my God, what have we here? We've got an authentic American genius. See, if you don't know Schiller and you don't know Shakespeare, you have no idea what he does in this thing. Hmm? And what he's doing. Because what was the method of Schiller? Every one of us knows it. Historically specific. He, take, he doesn't just choose any old play for England. He chooses Maria Stuart. He doesn't choose any old play for Spain. He chooses Don Carlos. He doesn't choose any old play for Germany. He chooses the Wallenstein trilogy. Right? Each of these take this period of religious war and transition right, and develops in depth real people who live these tragedies out. Hmm? Okay. So, so what is Cooper doing here? In the Bravo? In the Heidenmauer? In the Headsman? Because he savages Swiss society. This is one of the most savage indictments of Switzerland you will ever read. Right? I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, you are a gog at the end. He also savages Italy too, but but it's mainly a savaging Switzerland, right? And these traditional societies and what they do to individuals, the horror of these societies of oligarchism, right? But he's not doing it as oligarchism as some pamphlet and polemic, right? Because that wouldn't work. He's giving an American's view of why America is so unique, what we rejected what we didn't why we had to reject it there was no question these societies are savage are totally destructive to good individuals who get trapped in it and can do no good and get destroyed by it hmm? and I said oh my god this is a true American genius no wonder he was so savage he, he, he had he, and, and Lynn concurs completely with me on this because I said, I kept yeah, I, the day before Lynn said it, I said these are Contorian types. These these are this is like in a sense a tensor of of Riemann. These are not individuals as individual characters, though they are individual characters and react as individual characters, but they represent cultures and the cultural potential. Of the, of the different nuances of that society. The cultural potential of that society. And then he blows the whole thing apart. And shows the horror of the thing. Right? And any American reading that would say, oh my God. That's what, that's what we're not. And you contrast that to the Leatherstocking tales. And the and this beautiful I'm reading the little page manuscripts, which is Satan's toe, the chain bearer, and the engines, in which he sets it at the critic. Where does he where does he set both the um, uh, the leather stocking tales and the uh, and the and this little page manuscripts Satan's toe? Where French Indian War. French Indian yeah. War was the critical transition in American. Culture, American history, the French and Indian War, and he contrasts in Satan. So he takes Dutch society. The, the protagonist is a has an English father and a Dutch mother. Mm-hmm. In in uh, uh, set in uh, um, Long Island, right? And, which was Dutch. In, in, so so he has a Dutch mother and an English father. That's what then his his aunts and uncles are all Dutch. So it's all this Dutch what the Dutch settlement was was in American history. Then he throws in a Puritan, right, to show the interface with the Dutch 
English and the Puritans, right? Then he throws in uh, 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 the Indians. And he sets it in the 17, uh, 1756, 57, right? And then he throws in uh, the British Redcoats and the interface there, right? So he he's giving you all the elements that participated in this moment in history this French and Indian War. Hmm? And what it, what the maximum cultural potential of each of these are. And with the Indian, he also has Negroes, blacks in it, who are very noble. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, they're actually the best fighters in the, in the, in the actual uh, French and Indian War, at least in this, in this tale. Um, uh, but with limited, and the Indians, both good and bad, the, the Hurons, which are very bad, and another tribe, which is very good, and working with the Americans, and and the, the interplay of these different cultures, and the, and in, giving them the benefit of the doubt, the most culture, the, the most potential that culture had, right? And you get this magnificent symphony, right, of what, how, what was different about America. Because the, the, because one of the conceits he uses is the woman, in, in well I can't ruin it for you anyway the woman who's the beautiful soul in the thing has to choose between a British officer who who is about to become a lord and this guy Cornelius Littlepage uh, who was this who has a, a Dutch mother and a English father who's a totally noble god right and she had to choose between true nobility. Right, and a very erudite British officer who was going to actually become a lord, right? Uh, and and it, it's this brilliant, ironic interplay, and you don't know who she's going to choose, and in the end, she she makes it quite plain who she's going to choose. Uh, but 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 you you see the tension in this thing, and of course, so so the the the. the, the the point being, he he's not choosing any old time, any old place to set a story. What he's doing is a brilliant strategic studies, which puts him. You see, I, I had known this. I uh, you see, first time I saw Eakins, who's a uh, American painter, and and Lynn used to love this little thing of the the uh, the little child building blocks and the eye, uh, you know, and this. The, the 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 shadows, you know, played in a certain way because as a child, and of course any anyone knows that's what Rembrandt does, right? That, I mean that is the method of Rembrandt. Hmm? And I had known, I knew, if it was an American writer, it would have to be Schiller and Shakespeare. They would have to appropriate the best of Europe, right? Because that's what America is, right? Appropriate the best of Europe. Even though you you know he was not Schiller. I mean Schiller was an extraordinary genius, as Shakespeare was. I mean Schiller even said he wasn't even Shakespeare. So you know I mean you know you get these you know I mean Fenimore Cooper said of Schiller y humans could create a Goethe, but only God could, could create a Schiller. That's that's he understood this question right. And obviously, he and uh, uh, Irving, Washington Irving, go crazy about Schiller, openly. I mean, they, they, they're very clear on the question, right? But they appropriated the method, historically specific. These are not entertainments, right? So when he gets back from Europe, all hell breaks loose against him personally, right? And the the, the, the British realized this guy. Is dangerous because he had written the, Heide, the Bravo, the Heidenhauer, and the Headsman in Europe. And guess who was the? You'll never guess who the publisher of the Heidenhauer was. Henry Carey. Henry Carey <laughs> was the publisher in the United States of the Heidenhauer. Right. So, uh, so this, so if this is true, which I can prove. 
that he is the American shark. Right? And there's no question about it. His method, his, his ideas, his, his depth of historic understanding is Schiller. It's very complex. It's, it's not formal. It's brilliant. Right? If he is the American Schiller, Poe is alive then and Washington Irving is alive then. You actually had an American Renaissance. You actually had in literature an American Renaissance. And all hell, and the British went apeshit. Because if, you see, if America had its own fully independent culture that was in advance of anything Britain ever created except Shakespeare, right? And, and at that point, there was Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, I mean, Sir Walter Scott, who was writing these trashy romantic novels about, uh, um, uh, yeah, medieval. History, you know, and, and uh, you know, but there were action novels about medieval history. Um, uh, uh, you had the greatest writers in the world in America at that point, hmm? and they had to expunge. They killed Poe. They tr- and they they started going after mercilessly after Fenimore Cooper, and when he got back to the United States. This was under the period of Andrew Jackson, and he went wild. He had seen that Americans had forgotten their nobility, had forgotten what the mission was. And he wrote several books uh, called Home, uh, Home is Found, right? And it's a complete, dis- it takes on New York society and the absolute banality of New York society and what's happened to America. This lack of passion for the mission, this lack of understanding of what the hell we're about, right? And goes ape and writes several, two or three novels attacking the whole culture when he gets back from Europe because he's seen what's happened. And the election of Jackson, right? He realized how the hell we just got rid of the Bank of the United States. I mean, what the, you know? He was an ardent protectionist, as this whole network was, right? So he he goes, and that's all hell breaks loose. Right, the Whig press, who were not Whigs, they were basically the oligarchs. Right, remember the Federalist Party fell apart. Even though Alexander Hamilton was in the Federalist Party, the 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 the, hun, the junto, the the, uh, uh, the 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 oligarchical families of Boston, the Brahmins, ran the the uh, the uh, Federalist Party. When Hamilton had to go against the Federalist Party at a certain point. Right, uh, because it, it had gotten so crazy. Um, uh, anyway, it, 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 don't look at party labels. If you look at party labels, you won't get it, because he was supposedly a Democrat who's, uh, uh, who supported uh, Jackson, which he was not. Right, but he was in. The, but he hated the Whigs, so he joined. The, it's like Lynn. At one point, they said he was a socialist. Well, yeah, he joined the Socialist Party because they were the only ones fighting McCarthy. So he joined them and said, fuck it, at least they're fighting. At least they're saying something, so I'll join them. But Lim was never a part of the Socialist Party, in fact. right? He was so beyond them. It was a joke. And, and of course, the irony is who uh, Winfield Scott, uh, uh, who was the great nationalist uh, leader, uh, uh, Cooper organized the presidential run of Winfield Scott in the... In the uh, uh, 1840s, late 1840s. Um, so, so all hell breaks loose because they realize the genie is out of the bottle. That the promise of America, with Poe, Cooper, and um, um, Washington Irving, the the genie was out of the bottle, and they couldn't put it back in. So, so what does Cooper do? Horace Greeley, Thurlow Weed, they're going apeshit about all his books. Uh, and he sues them. And in every single one of the cases, he, he's his own lawyer. And, and he realizes the press were the key to the corruption of the United States. So he sued every single publisher in the United States and won. He won every single case he launched right, against these guys. And we're at the point that they just couldn't write anything about him. Mm-hmm. 
But if you were to take my my wife took a literature course. She was a literature major in college, uh, and it was an American literature course. She wasn't given one book by Cooper. Mm -hmm. Not one book by Cooper. <coughs> Why? He's like Lynn. That, that that if you get into Cooper, right, and actually understand what he was doing. In fact, we're the only ones now who could read him. Right, because because you cannot read him as action novel. If you try to try to do it as an action novel, you say, well, you skip all of his discussions. In the middle of the book, there's these long discussions, right? And it, you know, in a sense, they're histories. Because you know that's what she'll, I mean. In, in other words, it, it's very clear to me who's I've tried to write history before. You have actions and then you must comment on the actions because the actions intrinsically don't tell you what they are right so therefore what, what Cooper invents is a new form it looks like a novel but it's not a novel I don't know what you call it but it's not a novel I mean it, it just has the form of a novel right but what comes through and what they hated him the most for was that he insisted that humans were noble and had historic missions and that every one of his characters had a historic mission and was actually carrying it out on some level. That the historic mission of the United States was to found a republic free of oligarchism. That's the every single. I mean, the British do not get off lightly in this, right? The Puritans. It, it becomes a very fascinating. And the web of which see what what we could do. I mean, if people you say I don't want to ruin them for you, so you know, so at, at a certain point, you know, we people could read certain novels and we could discuss it because because I, I, I don't want to ruin it for you because I want you to discover as Lynn has said on this Gauss question you really have to discover what I'm saying I've given you enough so, th so that you, you could discover it right uh, if you if you wanted the Heidenmauer top on the list right because that's when I realized this is an authentic genius H-E-I-D-E-N-M-A-U-E-R 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 E U R or something like that, hide Mao. Um or A U R. Mao. M A U E R. Hide Mao. Uh, I said when when I read that it just clicked. Everything fell into place. Because when you get a genius like that, you know the enemy is gonna go absolutely apeshit. And they went absolutely apeshit. So anyway, so that's what I just wanted to uh, give you a little taste of it um, uh, in this first uh, celebration of, uh, of uh, James Fenwick Cooper. And I'm sure every year we can assemble and you know, I'll give you a little more. You know. I just got, I am so excited, Chaikin has all of Cooper's correspondence. And I've read several biographies, they're awful. They're awful. They have no. I, they cannot come to grips with this guy, mm -hmm. even his so-called friends. They have no idea what they're dealing with. If you don't understand Schiller and you don't understand Shakespeare, you cannot even begin to understand James Fenimore Cooper. But I had always hypothesized. I knew it just when I first time I saw Eakins, and I said Americans would have to assimilate the best of European culture and recast it in an American setting, right? With different problems. In other words, the, 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 the writing of the leather stocking tales and the writing of the this Satan's Toe Chamber, the Little Page manuscripts, are an application of these principles by a genius. He's not chill though. Like it, it, he he's right about that. Only God can create a show. I mean, uh, once in a while you get these, like a Beethoven, or a, you know what I mean. You, you just get these runaway things, you know, or a Larouche, you know. I, I mean, you, you, once in a while you bump into these things. They they happen. It's lawful, but they don't happen a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you know, they're so awesome. I mean, I mean, in truly, I'm not just using that word figuratively. I mean, they, they are truly awe-inspiring. People like Schiller and, and Sh uh, Shakespeare and LaRouche are just completely awe-inspiring. And we love them. And you admire them. And you, you strive for that. And maybe one of you will be that. I don't know. We can't rule it out. But anyway, so that's this is our first celebration. Happy James Turner Group. Maybe next year we'll have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> next year we'll be more well read. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. If you want to yeah, write, any questions? Write, write something else and put on the uh, website. Well, what I want to do is I'll tell you what, what I plan to do. Uh, I want to... I, I'm doing something on this 1688 Glorious Revolution. Because that is the the foundation of the Anglo-Dutch liberal system was literally that, I mean, you know, it's literally Anglo-Dutch. I mean, mm -hmm. if I said before, but I, I got the story now. And some some idiot wrote a book, Michael Baron, called "Our First Amer Our First Revolution," which tries to argue that 1688 was America, where America, the American Revolution was about ha getting that revolution here which is abs I mean it's frankly illiterate it's it was, quite it was that line of kings that suppressed yeah I know <laughs> oh, oh the whole thing is I, you know I'm agog that, that somebody they just I guess they expect everybody to be illiterate or I don't know what you know uh, uh, I just it's don't know what. Lynn, it's what Lynn says about the baby boom culture. I mean, just yeah, yeah. Whole liberal. Yeah, sure. Yeah, why not? You know, why, why not have this? I mean, this is my opinion about history. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Want. Anyway, I'm going to kick his ass. I'm going to use it. <laughs> I'm going to use it as a way of, as a foil, to present the 16. What what really happened? What Anglo-Dutch liberalism really is, and it's naked. It's full naked glory. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so that I want to do, and then what I want to do is I'm going to dive into this uh, kind of more Cooper thing, because because what I want to prove is what I said, because if you can establish that he, uh, you know, that he is the American Schiller, and he's alive with Washington Irving and Paul, you've established you had an American Renaissance, and the and and the British went eight. In a culture, that's what saved this culture. Remember, it, this was the bit of Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren. Things had gone insane, and this milit and it, it was tied to the American military. It, so, yeah. Well, you might be able to find some things if you if you follow this carry thread. Uh, sure. You might be able to find some oh sure. Things. Oh sure. On the effect of that. Oh sure, yeah. there's no question about it. The other thing about it is I've often thought of this period that if they can so vilify Cooper and if they can outright kill Poe and turn him into a pederast in everybody's minds, then who are you know who are some of these individuals that we just simply don't know about who are involved in this? Sure. Well, Chaykin has this very interesting. I'll, I'll circulate this. Is this uh, is somebody want to Xerox this? This is fascinating. This is a little fascinating what? report. This is a fascinating report by Chaykin on who these others are. Do you have an alpha number? No, it's not an alpha. I don't know what Chaykin did. Uh, uh, well, maybe Chaykin has it on the alpha. Uh, why doesn't somebody... I'll keep it. Please. If you need it. But ask Chaykin. Maybe he's got it on the alpha. It's, it's called uh, Military Intelligence and Physical Economy. It was done in August 20th, 2004. I can't imagine he didn't put it on the alpha. He just gave it to me in some other format. Okay, well, that's the uh, first. Thanks. That's the beginning. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs>